The whole of this day is the Lord's day. We began worshiping this morning together as a congregation and we resume again that worship as we gather now. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised by and he's held in high regard by all who know him. Uh, the works of the Lord are studied. We often look into creation and we see the sun and the moon and the stars and the, and the beauty of his handiwork about us. But beloved, it's time at this point that we look into our own hearts. We look to our own hands, our own lives, and, and realize that we give thanks to God who has made us. Let us worship the Lord together as we turn to Psalm 50. We'll be using the first version of the psalm and we'll be singing verses 15 through 18. As often we see in the between how God deals with his children and how he deals with those who hate him, uh, who the wicked man who withdraws. And so uh, we come then at verse 15, uh, following on verse 14 where the Lord bids us, Thanks offer thou to God, and pay thy vows to the Most High. And call upon me when in trouble thou shalt be. I will deliver thee, and, thy name, and my name thou shalt glorify. Let us worship the Lord. salvation that is uh, 
unfolding before our very eyes within our own lives. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the drawing of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the conviction of our sin that we might see ourselves in some manner as you see us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of faith. So many, Lord, have heard the testimony concerning the Lord Jesus and have turned their back and walked away in unbelief. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that marvelous work of grace whereby we have been enabled to cast ourselves upon the Lord Jesus Christ with a bold and confident faith that he is able to deliver us from, uh, Lord, the penalty of our sin, which we so justly deserve, but that he's also able by your gracious spirit to deliver us from the power of sin. Lord, that sin no longer has dominion over us. What a wondrous and glorious testimony we can bear only by the grace bestowed and by your spirit. Lord, we do thank you for uh, that gracious work that goes on in our lives day by day. Lord, uh, the, the working of the Spirit, of doing battle with uh, the desires of our flesh, uh, Lord, in order to form and mold and shape our very lives. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we serve a living God, a God who manifests yourself in, in ways that are distinguishable in the, in the midst of our daily circumstances and Lord to see the prayers that you've answered in our behalf but to see Lord the times that you've rescued ourselves rescued us from ourselves and, and, and the wickedness of our own hearts thank you Lord for the times that you've upheld us against the temptations of the evil one and, and enabled us Lord uh, to see that your word indeed is true that that there is no temptation that has overtaken us, but such as is common to man. And that you, Lord, are faithful to provide a way of escape that we might be able to bear that testing. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you do put us to the test. Lord, that we grumble and complain at times and wish we were already in heaven that we might not have to endure such testing. But we know, Lord, it's part of your gracious plan we thank you and praise you for your faithfulness. Lord, uh, we would have long turned back if it weren't for the sustaining of your grace, the might of your indwelling spirit. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we can say with the Apostle Paul, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Lord, we thank you for such an amazing love, Lord, uh, that, that seems so astounding, Lord, that, that you should love us, that you should show mercy to us when we have again and again uh, proved ourselves to be enemies of yours. But Lord, to hear the gracious word that you speak, that that you have loved us with that same love, Father, that you bear to the Son. Oh, Lord, that, that's such a love that's, that's almost beyond our comprehension to conceive that, that, Father, you would love your perfect Son and love us in the same fashion. Surely, Lord, it can only be because you see us through his righteousness. And Lord, we give you thanks for his redeeming grace. And Lord, we do pray now that you would, would minister to us as we're gathered again. Uh, Lord, that you would open your word to our, our minds and hearts, that you would help us, Lord, to, to be receptive uh, to your word. Lord, that we might uh, be hearers and doers of your word. Oh, Lord, that we confess before you too many times we've gathered to, to read your word, whether it be at home or in the assembly of your people. And, and it has been as if it were the seed that fell upon the hard pathway. And that bird, the devil, has snatched it away without any lasting effect upon our lives. 
Oh, Lord, we pray that we wouldn't merely receive your word with a joyfulness for the moment and then turn away at the first testing. We pray, Lord, that we wouldn't receive your word and have knowledge of it, and yet, Lord, uh, turn aside to the, the lusts of this world, the pleasures of this world that would, would lead us to bear no fruit from your word. Lord, you're, you speak of some bearing different measures of, of grain, Lord, some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. Lord, we pray that we might be privileged to bear an abundant harvest of the fruit of your word. We, we plead with you, Lord, that you would create the fruit of your spirit in our lives. Lord, we'd be able to love those who are unkind to us, that we would be patient with those who, who test us, Lord, in our daily circumstance, whether it be in our home or, or in the workplace or wherever we may go. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would be with us, Lord, to, to grant us that inner peace, Lord, that we might have a, a calm even in the midst of a storm that is obvious the working of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, we pray that all the fruit you describe that should be ours in Christ Jesus would be born in our lives. We long for that to be fulfilled. And Lord, we do long, Lord, for you to lead us day by day. Lord, that we might begin each day uh, realizing that we have risen uh, to meet with our Savior, that we are being led by your Holy Spirit, that we are the apple of your eye, dear Father, and that you love us and are watching over us. O oh Lord, bless us now as the people of God. We ask this in your most precious name. Amen. Let us consider, continue to praise the Lord as we turn back to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, we'll be reading in just a, a few moments, uh, Psalm 51, in which David speaks of God's tender mercies to him and, and leading him to confess his sin and, and to find forgiveness, the forgiveness that could only come because of what the Lord Jesus did that's described in Psalm 22. We hear the opening words of the psalm, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we recognize, recognize those words readily to be the words of our Savior upon Calvary's cross. And so we come to that portion we now sing, verses 27 through 31. And uh, we sing of the victory of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ in these words. All ends of the earth remember shall and turn the Lord unto all kindreds of the nations to him shall homage do because the kingdom to the Lord doth appertain as is likewise among the nations the governor he is. We sing to the end of the psalm using tune 101.
turn in your Bibles to Psalm 51, please. Psalm 51. Hear the word of the Lord. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice." Hide thy face from my sin and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good and thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness and with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Praise be his name. Let us continue to sing of our blessed Redeemer as we turn to Psalm 23. We'll sing the whole of the psalm using two number 147. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Let us give praise to our shepherd.
Let us again turn in God's word for instruction. We'll turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Here again, the word of God. This is God speaking. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brother and beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Thus far, the reading of God's word. I draw your attention then to our text, which is 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 12 through 16. And I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who hath enabled me that for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and, in, and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Thus far, the reading of God's word. The Lord put this passage on my heart to share with you this afternoon in a sense as a companion to the message that I shared this morning regarding the advantages of covenant children. But I have a concern in my heart if our covenant children are to truly embrace our Savior. It is utterly important that they understand how the Lord Jesus Christ has dealt with their parents and their grandparents if they are believers. In Reformed churches, we pray, place a great importance on sharing the gospel message accurately. 
We, we want to stress the necessity of Christ's atonement. We, we want to stress uh, the necessity of, of a sincere repentance and, and a gift of genuine faith that comes forth from God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the details of the, of the gospel message as recorded in the scripture are absolutely essential for someone to know the Savior truly. But we also see in the scriptures that oftentimes people come to the Lord Jesus in faith with only a fragment of the gospel message as we rightly understand it from the scriptures. Eventually, we trust that as they're led by the Spirit, they come to know the fullness of who Christ is and the wonder of God's salvation. However, I'm concerned, and it may not be true in your household, but I'm concerned that it may be true in many Reformed Church households, that covenant parents who are seeking to lead their children to Christ have not shared how Christ saved them. That your children, if they were to relate to their children how the Lord by his spirit led you to Christ, they wouldn't be able to tell them because they don't know. And my concern comes from having studied the passage that we're going to examine and 1 Timothy 1.16 and its surrounding context. Because the Lord gives us a clear example in his word of Paul declaring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to multitudes. But as he declares faithfully the gospel message of who Jesus is and what he has done and what the Holy Spirit does, to bring powerfully to bear on the lives of the people, he also shares his personal being brought under conviction by the Lord Jesus Christ and being led to Christ in faith. He shares his conversion experience. And what we have here in our text is is Paul declaring to us by the Holy Spirit. And so this is not just Paul's idea, but it's what the, the Holy Spirit has offered, authored through Paul, declaring that God, for whatever reason, we know one of the reasons was that he delayed so long in bringing Paul to Christ, was that he would show a period of extended long-suffering with the Apostle Paul in his wickedness to oppose the gospel so that the, the graciousness of the Lord might be manifest in his dealing with Paul that it might offer hope to those who would hear the gospel. It, it was a, a wondrous demonstration of the power of the gospel in a person's life. Uh, and Paul is testifying to this here, that, that uh, there needs to be this going on along with the gospel testimony concerning Christ, a testimony of those whose lives are being transformed by the very message. We might liken this as we think in terms of the covenant relationship with our children and our grandchildren. When we look in the Old Testament, we see the Lord having the people of Israel relate again and again and again and again the story of God's delivering them from Egypt and the captivity they experienced there. And, And that's part of their spiritual heritage. They remember this because it's it 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 impacts their lives so. Well, Paul is describing something here that happened in his life, and he's using this as a testimony to tell people, this is how God changed me, in order that they might have a hope that what Paul's telling them has validity and power. It's part of God's plan to persuade others by what he's done for your soul. And so... As we look at this passage together this afternoon, first of all, I'd I'd like to point us to what I would call the gravity of Paul's sin. He says, I'm the chief of sinners. 
Then secondly, I'd like us to, to consider the marvel of God's grace. Paul speaks of God's grace as being extremely abundant to him. And then I would like to suggest to you that this is the pattern that God commends to us. It's God's pattern for gospel ministry, gospel witness, gospel witness. We look first at the gravity of Paul's sin. In verse 15 he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus is set forth most gloriously as the Savior, the only hope. There's no other name given among men under the heavens whereby you must be saved. It's in calling on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to save sinners, but, but Paul wants us to see how great a sinner he was. Because otherwise you won't see how great a Savior Jesus is. As Jesus said to the Pharisees, if you have no sin, you don't need a physician. I came to those who were in need of a physician. And here Paul is essentially showing us how desperately spiritually ill he was in order that we could see how great Jesus is. In verse 13, he describes his sin. He said, I am a chief of sinners, but he says, I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. That's his summation of his life of sin. This is what the Lord Jesus delivered him from. And, you know, we, I know at times past in my spiritual immaturity, when, when I look at what Paul says about his life in Philippians chapter 3, where he says he keeps all the commandments, he, you know, he, he's lived a, an exemplary life. And, and then I hear him say, oh, I'm chief of sinners. I'm left with wondering, well, how great was his sin? But, beloved, if we look at what he said about himself and see it through the eyes of Scripture and through the eyes of God, you'll see that, indeed, he was chief of sinners, which will give us great hope in looking to the Savior. In our day, people blaspheme the Lord regularly. People take the Lord's name in vain. They speak evil. They make mockery of God. And uh, in the culture in which we live, sins against God are, are, are not seen as any big thing. Most of the time, sins against each other are not considered big things either. You know, they, they, they want to do away with all the Ten Commandments, but especially the first four. Paul says, I was a blasphemer. Not only did he speak evil of God, it was his his deliberate attempt in persecuting Christians to make them blaspheme God as well. That was what he was seeking to do, to bring down judgment on them, because blasphemy is a crime that is capital. In Leviticus 24, verse 16, the Lord records for us, and he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. It's a capital crime. It wasn't a little crime. I mean, think of how many times somebody says something to you that's offensive and you get all uh, upset. And yet, a lot of times, we bring the things that happen to us on ourselves in some measure. But God, who does no wrong, is so often blasphemed by people. Paul said, I was a blasphemer. And I caused other people to blaspheme the name of the Lord. Yet there was an encouragement because Jesus said, you can blaspheme me, you can blaspheme the Father. And it can be forgiven you. It's only the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that is unforgiven. But Paul went on also to say, I was a persecutor of the church of God. 
It doesn't seem like a big crime until you see it in the eyes of God. God describes his children as the apple of his eye. It's a beautiful metaphor that he uses because every one of us, if we think about it, if anything comes near our eye, what do we do? We quickly shut the eyelid to seek to protect our eyes. And the Lord is saying that we are as the apple of his eye. He desires to protect his children. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, as he continues to share a testimony regarding himself, he says, I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. He understood this to be a, a, a terrible sin. And you see, we have to pull together various things that are said by the Lord in the Scripture because the Lord Jesus, when he was preaching his last sermon before he ascended into heaven, he reminds that in it, inasmuch as you have done this unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And you might say, well, does this really apply to what Paul did to the Christians? Yes, it does. You remember Paul's conversion experience in Acts 9? What does Jesus say to him? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? But we haven't heard that Saul did anything personally to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the attack on the people of God that Jesus took as, an, as a personal attack upon himself. And so Paul understood the gravity of, of, of persecuting the church of God. In Acts 26, as he's giving an account of, of what he did before he was converted, at verse 10 he says, Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I did shut up in prison, having authority received from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even into strange cities. And he's talking about foreign cities. He went after them wherever he could. He hated Christians, and he hated the Lord Jesus Christ, and he perse persecuted the church of God. And Paul understood that this was one of the most wicked sins. And perhaps a way for us to understand the wickedness of this a little in more depth, we hear Paul saying to the church in Thessalonica in his second epistle, when he's speaking of the persecution that has been brought against the church of God, he says this at verse 6, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. He's describing hell. He's talking about unbelieving, but he's also talking about the persecutors of the people of God being cast into hell. And you see, if you see it in that light, you can understand why Paul would say of himself, not as an exaggeration, but a, a reality. He says, I blasphemed the name of the Lord by causing other people to blaspheme so I could bring judgment of a death penalty against them. And I, I persecuted Jesus Christ by persecuting those who are a part of his body. And I was worthy of hell. And beloved, if you're here today, because one of the things that's absolutely necessary in order to, to really grasp who Jesus is as Savior, you need first to understand how desperately sin sick you are. You see, Paul was sharing this so that he would give hope to sinners. He was sharing how bad he was. He, he says, so that others might have me as a pattern to hope for salvation. And you have to understand how desperately you need forgiveness in Christ. Or you won't come to him. And you also have to understand that he is able to forgive even the worst of crimes. Paul, the chief of sinners, forgiven in Christ Jesus. 
What is your besetting sin? There's forgiveness in Christ Jesus. But, but listen, what the scriptures teach us regarding sin. There's gravity in Paul's sin, but there's gravity in your sin as well. Galatians 5 and verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and as I read these, ask yourself, am I guilty of any of these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, Murders, drunkenness, reveries. And then he tells us essentially, that's not the end of the list, and the like. That there's other sins that you might be guilty of that aren't on this list. But if you stop for just a moment, have you lusted in your heart? Jesus said if you even lust in your heart, you're guilty of the sin. It's not just an outward act, it's also an inward act of the heart. You dabble with witchcraft or evil spirit things. You thought it was a game and played with it. Do you hate somebody? Is there somebody you can't stand in this world you hate? Do you love to stir up trouble between people? Maybe you're a little bit jealous. He says jealousy is one of the things here too. You're jealous of somebody else's attention in a relationship, and so you say things and maybe share slander about someone. It may be true, but it's intended to damage the relationship, and you share these things in order to create contention. Selfish ambitions. That's probably none of us in this room could get away from that one. Because until we are in Christ and Christ is really dealing with our heart, what, who do we live for? We live for ourselves. Is it to my advantage? That's what our, our question would be that we'd ask ourselves. Is it my advantage? And he says, regarding these things, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, sin doesn't seem so bad to us so often but we need to see it how God sees it another passage and there could be others that we could turn to is in Revelation 21 at verse 8 where we're told that hell the lake of fire which is a description of hellfire is reserved for the fearful and unbelieving and abominable, those who offend God with abominable acts, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, which is very similar to the other list that I read, but there's another one added there. All liars. You told a lie? Is there any one of us in this room that don't have problems? But speaking the truth when we're afraid that if we spoke the truth, it would get us into some kind of trouble. And so we fashion our responses to people in such a way to make sure that we don't have uncomfortable circumstances arise. See, Paul's trying to tell us that he's the chief of sinners. So that if you really see yourself and I see myself as God sees me, as he sees us, that we see that we really need a Savior. But we'd also understand that the Savior that the Father sent is able to take away such sins. He's able to take them away. And you see, that's the next thing that we come to is the marvel of God's grace. In verse 14, Paul, uh, describing himself as a chief of sinners, he says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 
Paul saying that God's grace is greater than my sin. He, he said essentially the same thing when he wrote his epistle to the Romans in chapter 5. He talks about how the law was given to people because early, in the early centuries of, of this world, they didn't have a written law code down. God had written on their hearts what they should do. They had a sense of right and wrong. And, uh, but because they twisted and distorted the way God had intended them to be, God gave the commandments so that they would, would have a written code. He gave it to the lawless, as, as the Holy Spirit, speaking through Paul, tells Timothy. He gave them a written code for those who were living lawlessly so that they could see their sin. And where the sin entered in, then the offense abounded. You see more and more as you look into God's word. And you see, that's why a lot of people don't care to read God's word, because as they read it, they begin to see more and more the things that they have done wrong that God doesn't approve of. But God intends for us to see ourselves as he sees us, not so that we'll just be depressed and go out and hang ourselves like Judas did. He shows us our sins so that we would know that we have a desperate situation and we would flee to the Lord Jesus Christ who can forgive our sins. Grace abounded more. And as Paul went on in Romans 5.20 to say, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. God has sufficient grace in Christ Jesus to forgive every sin. Every sin. Every sin. Now, some at that time, as you may well know, thought, well, with what Paul's teaching, that means you can go out and sin all you want to. God gives sufficient grace to cover all your sins. So, beloved, just go out and do anything you want to this week, and you just come back and ask for forgiveness. And, it'll all be... and Paul says, that's anathema. God forgives sin in order that he might make a righteous people, that he might turn us into those who are like unto our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But God's grace was absolutely amazing. And in Paul's experience, as he was confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ and the bright light that came from heaven that blinded him and he was led into the city and there Ananias met with him and ministered to him who was a, a Christian who had been converted before him. And Anna, Ananias says to him, as Paul later relates, uh, he said to him that he should Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. And Paul did that. And the Lord Jesus transformed his life. Paul later would testify to the, Philippian, to the Corinthian church in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15 at verse 10, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. See, he's describing what he would say to the, to the Galatians when he says, I was crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He's talking about the indwelling presence of Christ by the Holy Spirit in the life that changes you. And Paul could say, I'm a different man. I've been changed. It's the grace of God. God's ready to forgive, to show mercy to sinners. It probably was Paul sharing his testimony with those in Corinth that led many of them to turn to Christ. And he has a beautiful statement that I find very encouraging. In 1 Corinthians 6, after having given a long list of the sins like I, I shared in the, in, earlier in my message of things that would keep us out of the kingdom of God, that would keep us out of heaven, 
At verse 11, he says this, And such were some of you. And he's described homosexuality. He's described all kinds of gross sin that would be anathema to God. He describes all kinds of wickedness. And he says of them, and such were some of you. And he goes on to say, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It's the transforming power of the Holy Spirit working in a person's life. You see, it's not just, oh, I'm going to have another philosophy. I'm going to, I'm going to join in one of these religions that make you try to deb- live better and do better. He's talking about a living God who comes into a person's life and transforms that life, changes it. Paul would say, I am what I am by the grace of God. God is good. He's ready to forgive. He's plenteous in mercy to all them that call upon him. That's what we sing when we sing Psalm 86 at verse 5. We sing about the nature of the living God who's ready to forgive those who call upon him. God wants us to call upon his name. And he wants us then to bring about his glory when he saves us. When he works graciously in our lives, we are to praise him for what he's done for us. To tell others what he's done. And that's the way God has always intended it to be. We sing in the Psalms, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We'll sing that in the closing portion of the worship today. Psalm 107, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Tell other people what the Lord's done for you. That brings us to God's pattern for gospel witness, our closing portion. Beloved, I would suggest to you that When we share the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we need to also tell other people, if you are born again, if the Holy Spirit is living in you, you need to tell people what happened in your life. As we look at the passage before us in 1 Timothy 16, and Paul's example as the Holy Spirit has saw fit to record Paul's experience. I mean, many things are left out of the scriptures. Many things that Jesus did are left out of the scriptures, John tells us. He he thought that if all of it were recorded, you wouldn't have enough books in the world to record everything that Jesus did. He shares that at the end of his gospel. Well, God, writing through his servants by the Spirit, saw fit to tell us that the Apostle Paul's experience of God's grace was intended to give encouragement to other people who know what it is to be a great sinner, that you can come to a great Savior, that you can be forgiven of your sins, that your life can be transformed. Paul did this not only in in making this statement here in in 1 Timothy 1.16, but we see illustrated in the Scripture repeated again and again Paul's testimony concerning his conversion. In Acts chapter 9, the conversion story is told. It's told by Luke, which we are sure received it from Paul, what happened in his life. Later on in Acts, Luke records for us in chapter 22 and 26, Paul sharing his testimony as a means to try to bring people to Christ. Telling them what difference the Lord has worked in his life. So you see, this is not just a Christian philosophy. It's not just a Christian way of acting. He's saying, we have a living God who changes people's lives. 
He works in our lives. And, and he's telling his testimony to give hope to other people that you can have forgiveness and that you can experience what he is as a transformed person. I am what I am by the grace of God. Paul relies much in his ministry on his own personal experience. You go to Philippians chapter 3, and what does he say? He describes his life before coming to Christ, and then he describes his life in Christ, and he says that, that his extreme delight in life is knowing Christ. And laying hold on those things for which Christ laid hold on him. That's his, his utter delight and joy and excitement in life. To lay on those, hold on those things. Chapter 4 in Philippians letter. He tells them of Christ's all sufficient power to sustain him in every circumstance. Whether he's having wonderful times or whether he's having very difficult times in terms of temporal circumstance. Christ is there sustaining him. Paul's saying his life is a pattern that others who would come to Christ would, would see what God did in his life and, and they would say, there's hope for me. Yeah, you know, I, I, have, I have great reason to be confident that God will work. If there's someone here that hasn't hasn't come to Christ, I would plead with you to turn to the Lord Jesus, to call on the name of the Lord and ask that he would save you. But I would also say to those who know Christ, how many of you are here in this room, and I don't mean you have to answer out loud, how many of you, as you talk to yourself, how many of you know that you've told other people how the Lord Jesus has saved you? What were the circumstances? How did he come to you, as it were, calling you by name as he did Saul? Saul, he called you by name. Now, maybe it wasn't an audible circumstance exactly like, but you sensed God's call on your life. You sensed the Lord working. Have you told anybody else about how you were led to the Lord? I say this to parents as well. Because so many of you covenant parents, you have many children here, and you're trying to teach them to live the right way and to do the right things. And if they don't come to embrace Jesus as their Savior, you've just raised a whole bunch of Pharisees. What they need is to know Jesus Christ as their living Savior. To have heard the Lord call to their hearts. And one of the ways that God does this is he uses the testimonies of others who he's called to himself. You need to tell your kids. I'm going to guess there's at least one family, if not more, that, the parents have never told their children how the Lord Jesus saved them, from what he saved them. And you see, they need to hear. Parents, your children need to hear. I mean, because they look at your lives. Children look at their parents' lives day in and day out, and they see mom and dad still sin. What are they to conclude? Well, maybe the Lord didn't save them. They're still sinning. But we know that we're not without sin after being saved. But rather we have a Savior that we run to and we ask for forgiveness. And, and we know He readily ministers His grace to us to cover our sins. But what was it that the Lord saved you from? Do your children know? Now, Paul doesn't go on talking about the continued temptations, as it were, that he had in his life and his struggles with sin. But he clearly tells us with his testimony of God's salvation, he says, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor of the church of God. He tells us what he was doing when Jesus interjected his life into Paul's life and changed him. And I would suggest to you, beloved, that's what he would desire for us when we seek to tell others about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a lot of examples, and I don't have time to deal with them. Think back to the lady at the well when Jesus ministered to her. What did she do? 
She left her pot there at the well, and she heads back home, and she goes throughout her town, and she tells all of them, you got to come hear this man who told me everything I ever did. Now, that wasn't a very good explanation of the gospel message, but she was able to communicate what she experienced with the Lord Jesus Christ. We read as our Old Testament lesson, the experience of David. Psalm 51, as we understood it, is a description of David's response spiritually after he's committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered Uriah, her husband, to cover up the sin. And he's there in that psalm pleading with the Lord to wash away his sin, to take his sin away. But I particularly would draw your attention to those words where in verse 10 he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and do not take thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Well, there's real joy when you know your sin's forgiven. When your sins are forgiven, you have peace with God. There is joy. It's out of that delight and joy that Paul would go on to, I mean, that David would go on to say, and, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Verse 13, and this is the part I really want you to hear in connection with what I'm trying to communicate. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. What was it that David was teaching to sinners? What was it that would draw sinners to be converted? What, what, what would it be? Well, we're not specifically told in this passage, but the context would highly insinuate it was David saying, I'm an adulterer, I'm a murderer, and I found forgiveness through the Redeemer. And because of God ministering the joy of his salvation and the powerful working of the upholding spirit in his life, he says, I'll go out and tell sinners what you have done for me, and they will be converted. Isn't that what Paul said? 1 Timothy 1.16. He's saying, the Lord was patient with me, but then he saved me that I might be a pattern, an example to those who would yet believe. One more example. We read as our New Testament passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, where he speaks of the gospel coming to those in Thessalonica in the church there. Not just in word only. How many sermons have been preached just in word only and people walk away unchanged? But he says, the gospel came to them also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. They were, they were assured of the forgiveness of their sins. And he goes on in verse 7 to say, and that they were examples to others. That others could see what God had done in their lives and they were caused to hope. And it says not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but he says elsewhere where it spread. And you go on in verse 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad. So that we need not to speak anything. He's saying that people hearing about the conversion experience of the Thessalonian Christians made people ready to receive the gospel. People were amazed by the grace of God. They were caused to hope that God would do the same thing for them as he'd done for these dear people. We have a living God that changes people's lives. People need to hear it. 
We're not just simply telling a story of what was done 2,000 years ago, which is absolutely important because that sacrifice on the cross was made once for all. And Jesus took that blood to the heavenly throne room and offered it on behalf of us who trust in him. But people need to know that we have a living Savior who makes a lot difference in your life today. We need to tell this alongside the gospel message. We sang earlier in the service from Psalm 22, which talked about Jesus' crucifixion. We sang that closing portion of the psalm, which testifies at verse 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. A seed shall serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. It's Maybe referring to a number of things there, but it's referring also to what Christ did on the cross. That we will tell other people, even those who aren't even here amongst us today because they haven't been born yet, what the Lord has done. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he shed his blood on Calvary's cross. I asked you earlier, do other people know what God's done for you if you're a believer? Have you told others how he worked his grace in you? Is there maybe a neighbor or co-worker who've never heard you share? Maybe you've talked to them about the gospel, but you never told them how the Lord Jesus Christ has changed you. The work of God in your life. You see, there's always a struggle because you know you're not perfect and they're going to see the sinful side of you as well. But what they need to hear us humbly acknowledge that we are sinners and we've run to the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness for our sins. Are there those in your household? A spouse? Your children? Never heard how the Lord really brought you to him? Oh, they know you're a sinner. <laughs> we all sin, don't we? They know you're a sinner, but how did the Lord save you? We have the example of Paul testifying by the Spirit that his example is to encourage others. Surely your story could be an encouragement to others as well. I'm concerned that parents share with their kids. I want them to embrace the covenant promises that God has made. But if you've never shared how the Lord Jesus saved you from your sin, all they do is see parents sin. I asked a young person earlier this afternoon, I said, you know, well, I made the comment to a, younger, a young person, I said, you know, probably most of us remember what our parents did wrong. We don't except on special occasions, remember all the things our parents did right. And so when you talk about coming to the Lord Jesus, you're, you parents, you're going to have children who, who see you the way you really are, on the outside anyhow. Have they heard the testimony of God's saving grace in your life? How he's changed you. And let me give you this caution, if any of you are moved by what I'm sharing with you, to, to go out and to share with a neighbor or a coworker or somebody in your family that needs to hear what God's done for you. Please note, when you look at the example of Paul and David and so forth, they don't, the Holy Spirit does not go into the gory details. We're told about David's adultery and murder, but we're not told what transpired between David and Bathsheba in the bedroom. I hope you're getting my point. 
He doesn't go into the details, though he does say how he murdered Uriah by using other peoples as, as his instrument. When Paul shares about his persecution of the church, he gives us enough detail that we can understand how he attacked the Lord Jesus Christ by attacking his people. But he doesn't go into the details of how he drugged them through the streets, what he did to torture the people, and so he doesn't go through the dory details. And what I share this as a caution. When you share your testimony, if you would, with someone else, don't go through the gory details. Only tell enough that's sufficient to, sh to tell others how great a sinner you are and how great a savior you have, that they might come to hear the gospel message and to respond to God's offer of grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. Is there somebody that the Lord would lay on your heart that you need to share with? I'll leave it between you and the Lord. Let's look to him in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the testimony of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have not given us in your word a list of all your children who've lived perfect lives and have done so wonderfully. But, Lord, we're often surprised when you tell us of the wickedness, even of the forefathers of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we believe that you planned out your plan of salvation in such a way that you would display the shame of your servants and the glory of your grace that we might be given hope who are sinners alive in this day. And Lord, we do pray that you would be pleased to work a work of grace, perhaps with someone in this room or someone who will hear this message in the future, Lord, and will be hearing, Lord, a testimony perhaps from multiple people in this room who are telling what the Lord has done for their souls. And they're given reason to be persuaded that, that this is possible for them as well. Oh, Lord, please work by your Spirit. Lord, we long to see many saved, Lord that your kingdom would flourish and, Lord, your kingdom would come here on earth even as it is in heaven. Oh, Lord, hasten the day of your com coming. Lord Jesus, come quickly. We ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 107. Psalm 107, we'll be singing the first nine verses of the psalm. And the tune number, if I find it here, is 149, tune 149. Before we begin singing, I would note for you, it's in verse 2 that the Lord commands us, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. They were to tell others what the Lord has done for us. And he goes on to talk about uh, the Lord gathering his people from all different areas of the world, from the north, south, east, and west. Uh, it talks about... Uh, God giving satisfaction to the thirsty soul. And in verse 8, Oh, that men to the Lord would give praise for his goodness then and for his works of wonder done unto the sons of men. For he, the soul that longing is, doth fully satisfy with goodness. He, the hungry soul, doth fill abundantly.
would you join me in standing? If anybody would like to hear my testimony later of God's saving grace, I'd be happy to share it with you. But receive now the benediction of our God. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.